Now, before we get started with the review of the Acolyte premiere, a little spoiler warning for you all. Spoilers! The much-anticipated and oddly hated before it even released the Acolyte series has dropped its two-episode premiere, and while it may not have featured any Star Wars water cooler moments and had most of its big moments spoiled by the trailers, what we got story-wise is intriguing, and boy, does the world look and feel amazing. So yes, I'm down and looking forward to how it all plays out. Let's start there with the visual design because the Acolyte looks absolutely lived in Star Wars. The use of practical sets, aliens, props, etc. all really helps to make this era of Star Wars feel alive and from a real place in our galaxy. The aesthetics of this show feel like a marriage between George's original films and their groundbreaking practical effects and sets and the prequels with their cleaner, more pristine landscapes peppered with CG to spruce things up a bit. It really did feel like we were watching a prequel to the prequels thanks to the visual design and I also found the musical score to be very PT era correct and complementary to the narrative and world. For the most part, I also enjoyed meeting a bunch of new characters ranging from Jedi to unaligned force users to a guy who pretends to be a traitor but is probably a Sith apprentice himself. More on Kamir in a bit. Oh, we even got a new douchey Jedi in the form of Yord, who is challenging Mace Windu for the title of Mr. By the Book and giving Kylo Ren future inspiration for hanging out topless as a force user. The Acolyte's core mystery of the Brendock fire, the twins, and how four Jedi were involved in a perceived disaster is also very intriguing. Not to mention what's going on over on May's side of things with Kamir and the Teeth Mask guy. I do find myself really wanting to know exactly what happened to Kaz Osha to hate May and to think she was dead and also what led her to leave the Order. How May survived and why she's hell-bent on killing the four Jedi. And then of course, who is the masked man and is he an actual master or is he just an apprentice trying to take out his master by recruiting May and taking advantage of her hate. Surprisingly, I'm finding Kamir, a character no one was really focusing on before the premiere, as being anything more than a scoundrel type, as the most mysterious and possibly narratively important character. I can almost guarantee that this dude is the real Sith apprentice who is recruiting May to take out his master. He may very well be the man behind the teeth mask. I don't see him being the actual master because both he and May refer to a him, so there is another person in their orbit directing them, but I do feel strongly that Kamir is fulfilling the actual apprentice role and May is his acolyte. Apprentices need to recruit acolytes to take out their masters, and it's been done time and time again both in Lucas, Star Wars, and Legends, so I don't think this theory is off base. The dude starts quoting the Sith Creed to the point May is like, I get it, enough, I understand that peace is a lie because you Sith talk about it all the time. How about how he knows how to make poison? Is that a common smuggler slash scoundrel skill set? What about the fact that he was able to defend himself from May's sneak attack after she wanted to kill him for ratting her out? Hell, the fact that he ratted her out to the Jedi is very Sithy. Just bookmark this review because Kamir is going to be the actual surprise twist of this show. In terms of what didn't work for me in this pre premiere, I will say that I think Lucasfilm did an absolute disservice to these episodes by including nearly every single big moment and scene in the trailers leading up to its debut. There was nothing left to surprise because all the major beats were covered in the trailers. We just got to see more of the nuanced scenes, but the big action beats and reveals were already revealed. Don't even get me started on the twin stuff. I'm not even sure why they even tried to pretend that we didn't know that from trailers and posters. So it's good that the twist, in quotes, is out of the way, but it seemed like they wanted to suck the air out of that reveal before the show even released, which is odd. At times, some of the line delivery was also very prequel-esque and, and, and seemed like George himself was directing, but mostly the performances were pretty solid. The Acolyte definitely didn't blow me away or make me feel like I was watching something new being done in the Star Wars universe, but I did enjoy it and I'm very eager to see where the mystery takes us. I do think if the final narrative reveal hits, people will ultimately fall in love with this show and its characters, but if the final reveal is easily guessable or overly weak, the Acolyte will be DOA. Top Moments Time even though it's been shown a zillion times, finally seeing the Indara V made doing full was a treat. It sucks that Carrie Ann had to be the first Jedi to die, but damn did she look awesome and graceful doing it. 
I found the whole fight to be a ballet of sorts, and I appreciated how the moves were focused on how each character would act in the situation. Mei using Indara's Jedi nature against her to beat her was brilliant, and it showed that she's a formidable foe being trained by an even more formidable foe master. Plus, it was 100% Jedi Trinity in action, so yes, it was great to behold. Up next, I have the prison ship crash. This scene was just pure Star Wars chaos from start to finish. I loved the mix of aliens and humans trying to break out and how they all looked and acted. It was a Star Wars circus to the max, complete with the chair droids and classic looking and sounding escape pods. Alright, this scene may be weird to some of you, but I really loved the visuals of May trying to kill Torben while he was taking the Barash vow. It's not really something we've seen before in live action Star Wars and it showed how powerful a Jedi can be when he is one with the Force and fully communing with it. Droidicas don't have Jack on Torben's shield, that's for sure. And finally, this last one is simply seven words. Wookie using the Force in live action. Enough said. And for our eggs and references. How about getting some sort of an opening crawl complete with a downward camera pan? Nemoidians, and they sound less like people doing racist Asian accents. Tassie Loa here is a Zygarian, making her first appearance in live action. This species was made infamous in the Clone Wars for being slavers. Classic looking escape pods and sounds took me right back to the Tantive 4. Karlak was the only not new planet featured outside of Coruscant in the Acolyte premiere. This snow world first appeared in the Clone, War, Cl Clone Wars A Friend in Need episode. Pretty sure Osha has some form of force walkie-talkie like Kylo and Rey. And while May doesn't seem able to reciprocate, their twin bond sounds and feels very dyad-like, although possibly a perverted version of it. Torben took the Barash Vow, named after Jedi Master Barash Sylvain from the High Republic era. Kamir, our Sith apprentice, wink wink, mentioned the huts, and finally, Yor dropped the iconic, I have a bad feeling about this Star Wars line. Hey, make sure to tune into our live stream this week for our deep dive into these two episodes. Consider joining the channel, subbing, or liking this video. There's always time for Star Wars time, and if you listen to the Star Wars time show, the Force will be with you always. Thank <laughs> you.